seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture which we read just a moment ago. We're over in Exodus chapter 14. The message, somewhat tongue-in-cheek entitled, 1,200 flat tires all at once, or is there a manufacturing lawsuit hidden in the text? <laughs> As a lawyer, I could not resist that. You know all the different manufacturing lawsuits on various vehicles with the airbags and tires and other things. This was a situation in which God destroyed something that was not a manufacturing defect. For it was the Lord who looked through the Shekinah and took off the wheels of the chariots. It's amazing. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your powerful word and for your power against foolish men who think they are mighty. And they have all the best weaponry and all the best warfare, and it is nothing for you to knock off the wheels. Help us to remember that you are God. Man is not God. Man is not powerful. Man is weak and puny. But you are God. You are the sovereign Lord of the universe who spoke a word and it came into being. And you have deigned to call yourself our Father. How we thank you for that. And you've given us the privilege of knowing you as our own God. Not like the pagan gods, the phony gods, but as the real God, the true God, the everlasting God, the self-sustaining, self-sufficient God, the God who created all things, who sustains all things, and will bring to culmination all things to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for your blessings again on your word as it goes forth that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall last week we finished looking at the ways that God uses light in Scripture, and we looked at the last six ways last week in which God uses light to teach us about himself to teach us about his character, to teach us about his acts and actions, to teach us about the way in which we are to live, to demonstrate to us the benefits of being in light and not darkness and under the control of Satan and his demonic forces. We had looked at the historical narrative in Acts chapter 9 and saw that Paul based his entire ministry on the incident of where he came face to face with Christ as the resident of the Shekinah glory on the road to Damascus. We saw how, God, how Paul used that in his defense before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. Then we saw that Jesus is like the light that reaches our eyes and through our eyes illumines the entire body. That without sight you're crippled, you're handicapped, incapable of doing almost anything in the general world without external help. Because seeing light lets you enjoy beauty. Being able to see in the light protects you from danger before it reaches you. Seeing in the light it lets you help others. Seeing in the light gives you confidence. It overcomes your fears. Spiritual light lets you see the world from the divine perspective. Light lets you plan in advance because then you can perceive things that are still far away. And of course we noted that for the believer, the word of God does all of those things. It lets you enjoy true beauty. It lets you be safe from danger that otherwise would harm you. It lets you help others because you know what God wants you to do. Seeing the light of God's word gives you confidence for the future because you know God has made promises that he will not fail. And the spiritual light from God's word lets you perceive that the world really isn't all that it makes itself out to be. You see it from the divine perspective that the things of earth are really rubbish compared with the glories of heaven. Light from the Bible lets you plan in advance because you perceive things that are still far away. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. The fourteenth thing that we saw was we learned that when Satan is in control, God makes sure that the earth understands the wickedness of following Satan through judgmental darkness. 
and we had done a whole series on judgmental darkness, when Satan thinks he's in control, God lets people on earth know that it's not good by sending judgmental blindness and judgmental darkness. Sixteenth, we talked about how Satan also tries to imitate light as a false god. Seventeenth, we talked about Jesus also leading us through the darkest nights of our sojourning here on earth. You may be going through a dark time. We all do it sometime or another. You're going through a time where there just doesn't seem to be a way. Everything seems too hard. Everything seems impossible. Everything seems out of order. Things don't seem to function the way that they're supposed to. But we have God's promise that Jesus will lead us through the darkest night of our sojourn here on earth. And of course, God did that quite dramatically during the apostolic period, and we saw that in Acts chapter 12. And then 18th, because Jesus is the light, he is able to uncover and judge the hidden things of darkness. Light will destroy darkness. Darkness does not destroy light. Light destroys darkness. 19th, we saw that Jesus Christ, the creator, made physical light on the first day of creation. And we're going to see some parallels uh, today as we look into the text and see God looking through the Shekinah glory, looking at Pharaoh's army, and then pulling off the chariot wheels. Jesus Christ was the one who made physical light on the first day of creation because it reflects his glory and his character. John chapter 1, verse 1, tells us that Jesus Christ is the creator. In the same way, Jesus gives spiritual light because it reflects his glory and character. And then, 20th, we had a recap of the plague of darkness and saw how our text in Exodus reflected the contrast between light and darkness all the way from the plague of darkness to the crossing of the Red Sea. That was, you remember, the ninth plague. And darkness always precedes death, just like the plague of darkness preceded death. I gave you a little quiz last week. I'm not going to make you write it down right now. One of these days I might do that just to see how many of you still can remember it. Remember I gave rewards last time for everybody who could remember all ten plagues in order. Oh, I am so tempted to do that again just to see if anybody remembers what you've learned. But anyway, the ten plagues, blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death. We saw the relationship between darkness and hell the relationship to the Shekinah glory. We talked about hot smoking darkness is what will characterize hell and hot smoking darkness is also in the Shekinah glory and we talked about hell as a real place. We talked about all the truths related to hell that are not accepted by the world. The devil is not the king of hell, it's a place where he will be punished. Hell is where all unbelievers will spend eternity. Hell is where rebellious fallen angels, the demons, will spend eternity. Hell is where all the people who take the mark of the beast will spend eternity. Hell is where the beast and the false prophet will spend eternity. A dark, terrifying, screamingly hot place. And then we looked at the contrasting truths about light. Light is the biblical picture of heaven. Darkness is the biblical picture of of hell. And we went through a whole series of things related to the Shekinah glory, blazing forth and destroying all the temporal things of earth that we so much covet, so that we so much want, and yet they are rubbish as far as eternity is concerned. We talked about judgment and the three words that are used of the miracles of the Antichrist and the judgment on him, their lying powers, signs, and wonders. We saw God blinds the wicked with darkness. There's no return from darkness. And by the way, the, that disproved the spirit mediums. You don't get messages from people who are dead. You get messages from demons who are impersonating people who are dead. And so then we saw the essential key of tying it all together. What was God trying to teach Israel in the startling contrast between light and darkness at the Red Sea, at Mount Sinai, at 40 years of the wilderness wanderings? There were two things. We learned number one. It was a point of reference. Israel, all the way through the Old Testament, is brought back by the prophets as they are speaking to Israel in its sin, they are brought back to the Red Sea. The prophets continually refer to how God formed Israel as a nation at the crossing of the Red Sea and how God made a covenant with them and they made a promise to God to only serve him. The prophets reference that continually because God expects us to keep our promises. He makes an everlasting covenant with us. He expects us to keep our promises to him. 
And so the prophets continually, as Israel has fallen into sin, the prophets continually bring the crossing of the Red Sea back to Israel as a point of reference. And number two, it is a warning memory for Israel when they are tempted to sin. Point of reference, warning uh, memory, it always takes them back to that crossing. We talked about Joshua reminding the people that it was an impenetrable darkness. We talked about the darkness of the Shekinah for judgment. We talked about God bringing light of the Shekinah for blessing. Many, many things about the darkness and the curses of the law at Mount Ebal uh, versus Mount Gerizim. The thick darkness of the Shekinah being at Calvary. That was the darkness that covered the face of the earth for three hours, just like the three days in the tomb and the three days of darkness in Egypt. It was the darkness of judgment of sin laid upon Christ. We saw that the resurrection was at the beginning to dawn of the dawn, the light, the first day of the week. We talked about as at creation, like at the moment of salvation, Jesus brought light out of darkness. And in hell through all of eternity will always be darkness. Then we looked at the beautiful contrast between the darkness of hell and the glories of heaven. And we read that passage out of Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 and following. We covered a lot of material last week. We looked at the three parallels, light versus darkness, salvation versus damnation, freedom in Christ versus bondage to Satan. And then we closed with the question, are you ready for darkness and death? And how we are reminded of the shortness of time before we have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. So that brings us to our text today. That was a fast review of a lot of material. Let's look back at that passage in Exodus 14, beginning in verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. I think the first observation we can make on verse 21 is that obedience produces blessing and fulfillment of the promises of God. Remember, God had just told Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and tell the children of Israel to go forward. At the moment God said that, the sea was still there. Pharaoh and his army were right behind the children of Israel. Perhaps they were already trying to gather together and huddle a little bit and say, maybe we can make a compromise or maybe we can run away this way or that way, north or south. Uh, maybe, maybe if we dig a hole, we can bury one of our kids under the hole and Pharaoh won't see them. Who knows what was going through their minds, but they were in a panic. And God has just said to Moses, why are you hollering about this? Why are you crying to me? Stretch out your hand over the sea. That doesn't seem like a very rational thing to do, does it? Go down to the water and stretch out your hand. Lord, the Egyptians are back there. What do you want me to do down here at the ocean and stretching over my hand? If Moses had disobeyed, would God have parted the sea? Only God knows the answer to that question, but usually when we disobey, God does not bless us in the same way in which he would if we obey. Obedience produces blessing and it produces fulfillment of the promises of God. Do you realize that critical moment with one man and one arm over the sea was going to determine the timing of a blessing 400 years before that God gave to Abraham. That God would bring them up out of Egypt. You remember Genesis 17? The third time that God gives the blessing or the promise to Abraham about his seed. In Genesis 17 is where Abraham cuts the covenant with God and walks between the pieces of the animals that he's slain and then a horror of great darkness falls upon him and the Shekinah glory, this, this flaming pillar, just like in Exodus, moves between the parts of the pieces. We have it again. He's shown up again. God cutting his covenant with Abraham, showing up again here in 
Exodus, God's going to cut something else besides cutting the pieces of animals and walking between them. God's going to cut a body of water at a point that is 118 miles wide. And his people are going to walk through it with him as he makes his covenant with Israel and fulfills his word to Abraham. God cuts covenants. And no man can annul them. Moses was a point person. Maybe someday God will make you a point person. You don't know whether or not it will happen. Well, where you will be standing by the edge of the sea, so to speak. And there's some promise that perhaps is only vaguely in the back of your mind back here, maybe a generation or two ago. And God gives direction. By the way, this is where he gives direction. Anything that is contrary to the word of God is not the direction of God. Study his word, that's where you get his direction. And you will be faced with what seems an impossible task, an irrational request. And God says, move forward. You're the point man. And you have to step out in faith. That's what faith is all about. We walk by faith, not by sight. You have to step out. Be sure you're following the direction of God and not the direction of the flesh, the emotions, the lusts of the flesh, the human will, the world around you, the demonic forces, Satan's goadings. Make sure you're following the word of God, but you step out in faith. And then God does a miracle to fulfill a promise that he made eternity past. We have so much to learn here. In the very first verse, obedience produces blessing and the fulfillment of the promises of God. Number two, still in verse 21. Sometimes it takes a season, whether short or long. Sometimes it takes a season for God to answer our request. Each part of that fulfillment. All night long, the east wind blew. It didn't have to blow to push the waters back. It blew to dry the ground. Because it says the children of Israel went across on dry ground. You remember that had been at the bottom of the ocean. Sometimes it takes a season for God to answer our requests. And that leads us to the third observation on verse 21. When some part of creation can fulfill the will of God, he uses it. Now, God could have easily dried the ocean bottom just like that. Split the water, dried the ocean bottom. But many times God uses part of his creation to fulfill his will. Do you remember what we've been studying in Acts? As the Apostle Paul is sail sailing across the Adriatic and, and a storm hits called Eurotlidon. It's an incredible hurricane. And it blows them all over the place. Over 200 people on board that boat. 276 people. It's amazing it didn't sink, but God kept that boat afloat. He just wanted to teach them a lesson, shake them up a little bit so that they would learn that there is a God in heaven when the Apostle Paul preached. God uses things on earth in very specific divine ways to accomplish his purposes. We can be thankful for that because you know what? God also uses people. Never forget that. God 
uses people. He called you not to sit, but to serve. He has empowered you by the indwelling Holy Spirit so that you might be of practical use to him in telling others about Jesus. God could have planted big, huge asteroid speakers where they hovered over each one of the different countries on earth, speaking the language of that country and proclaiming the gospel down there in Chinese, in Hindi, in Pakistani, in you know some South American native dialogue. He didn't do that. He called you and me. But ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God uses people. God also uses the creation that he made to teach us lessons about his eternal power, head, power and godhood, so that, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, they are without excuse. God is using some powerful elements of earth in this passage. He uses a strong east wind and he uses some walls of water that are about to collapse. Notice something else. The land was dry after being blown on for the duration of the night. It was, not, it was dry, not mud or marsh. I can remember as a child, I was attending a Methodist Sunday school class and the printed lessons that came from the headquarters said that the way that Moses and the children of Israel got across the Red Sea was that they were traveling light and so they waded through the marshes, the reedy marshes and uh, they managed to get away because Pharaoh and his chariots got stuck in the mud. That is not what is described in our text. We have a miracle here. A genuine miracle that does not happen through accident or natural circumstances. They went across on dry ground, not even mud, like the liberals say. They were not on the edge of the sea or the sea border. It says they were in the middle of the sea. They went through the midst of the sea. And so you get the point. It says that Pharaoh and his chariots went into the midst. That means the middle of the sea. They weren't skirting along the border. They went into the middle of the sea. There's a sovereign God in heaven who does miracles. And this is nothing too big for him. He made it after all. And it's only a small, tiny part of the planet. A tiny little bit of water compared with the 70% of the Earth's surface that is covered with water for him to just draw a little line across a space about that big is no problem at all for God. Notice something else. We get down here to verse 21. Each party did his part. God waited for Moses to obey before sending the wind. God never asks you to do something that he doesn't empower you to do. But he does the things that you and I could never do. But he expects you to do what he calls you to do. Don't say, well, God's sovereign. God's almighty. I don't need to do anything because after all, God is out there and God can do it if he wants to do it. Listen, he has given us commands, many of them in scripture and many prohibitions too, where he expects us to obey. And he's not going to send his blessing or demonstrate himself strong on our behalf until we obey him. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Action is the key. Do it immediately. Joy you will receive. You know, the old children's songs are pretty good. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. God expects obedience. Notice something else here. It says, the waters were a wall on both sides, on their right hand and on their left. Not just on one side. Now you know when Israel crossed the Jordan River, it only built up on one side. 
The water was coming down toward them, and when the priests touched their feet into the water, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, like God told them to do, and the water was at flood stage, suddenly, whoosh, it was like a big wall there, and the water started building up behind it. Back for about 30 miles upstream, it was building up. And God didn't let it run around the edge of the little wall that he put up here and then it turned around and ground and everybody else out here on the outskirts. God held it back, kept it in its course, and backed up the water all the way 30, 35 miles up north. The children of Israel walked across. They took 12 great stones out of the center of the river and put them up on the bank, took more stones and put them in the center of the river. But here we have the water on both sides being held back on both sides because you see they were crossing in the middle of the sea not a flowing river the middle of the sea now we come to that term wall oh how interesting it is verse 22 the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left a wall unto them on their right hand and left. You know, as you look at the Old Testament, I, I started this particular study more than 40 years ago. I got so excited about it. There are 12 different words used in the Old Testament that are translated wall. 12 different words that are translated wall. I'm just going to run through them very, very quickly for you so you'll see the difference. The first one is sure, which is like a fence around a pasture. That's not the wall uh, word that's used here. There's kira, which is a wall built in a trench, so that you would dig a, a trench around your city and then put a like a barricade wall with thorns and stuff down at the bottom so people couldn't just run down the trench and run up the next side. There was guadare, which is an enclosure or a hedge. That would be like for uh, keeping sheep in at night. You know, and the shepherd sits in the gate of it. There's hayel, which is an army rampart or a trench or a bulwark they build to get up to some place like they did at Masada when the Romans attacked uh, Masada they had surrounded the base for several years they couldn't get up to the fortress Herod had built that fortress one of the many fortresses he built all over the country so that any time an enemy attacked he could always run to one of his fortresses and be safe well Masada was one of those and over 900 Jews had fled there during the second Jewish revolt they were up on top and there was only what's called the snake path. I've been up on top of Masada. A snake path that curls back and across the, face, across the face of the cliff. And if you try to do that, it's single file. Anybody up above can throw down big boulders and smash you dead or shoot you or pour boiling oil. I mean, there was no way the Romans would be, be able to get up there. So they built base camps all the way around the, the base of Masada. And finally what they did, they started on another bluff a little plateau off to the side and the Romans with their helmets dug up dirt and poured it in piles until they built a ramp from this slightly lower plateau all the way across to the walls of Masada and then they dragged their battering rams remember they didn't have the kind of machines we have it was all human labor. Now they had, you know, fulcrums and pulleys and all those kinds of things, but, but they had to do it by back-breaking labor. They pulled those things up to the top of the ramp. And they got them coming up the ramp. And the, the defenders of Masada, of course, saw that the end was near. It's a painful story. And the night before the Romans breached the wall, the leader gathered all the men. He said, which of you would see your wife and children bound in chains as slaves to Rome? It's better that we die free men. And they drew lots. Each man killed his own wife and children. And then one by one, they killed each other the only one was left and he fell on his own sword and the Jews today take all the new army recruits to the top of Masada where they hold a service of remembrance and they cry out together 
Never again Masada. Josephus records it because there were two women who hid in one of the cisterns and recounted what went on that night. And when the Romans breached the wall the next day, all they found were dead bodies. But the Jews had decided not to destroy all their storehouse of food and water. They had enough where they could have lasted a decade had the wall not been breached. So you have an army rampart, a trench, a bulwark. You have Usharana, which means an upright wall. It really tells you that something's standing upright. You have Geder, a circumvallation. That is, the emphasis is on the enclosure part of it. You have Kotel, and now some of you have heard that word because uh, that's a word that means that which is compact, but that's the word that's used of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. You've seen the pictures of it where the Jews come down and they, you know, bow in front of the wall. They leave little pieces of paper in the wall. They leave a small stone in memory on the wall. There are ritual washing fountains there. And you see the Orthodox Jews, the Dati'im, with their big fuzzy hats and their dark black coats. Their long peyote, their, their side curls and their beards. They're going like this in front of the wall. That's the Kotel. You have Hayats. That which separates the inside from the outside, like <laughs> this is the inside of the wall, that's the outside of the wall when you go through the door. You've got harutz, which is a trench barricade. You know, that's what moats were for around castles in the medieval period. But then we find the word that is used in our text. It's homa, a protecting wall, a massive city wall. That is the only way that it is used in the Bible. And it is used dozens of times. I'll give you some illustrations in just a second. But Homa, a massive protecting wall, C-H-O-M-A-H. The C-H is a ket in Hebrew <laughs> sound. Homa. Some other places where it's used so that you can see the context. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 29 through 31. Now this is the word that's used for the walls on either side of the children of Israel, but the walls are made out of water. Not ice, water. God is supernaturally holding them up. Leviticus 25, 29. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it. Within a whole year after it's sold, within a full year he may redeem it. And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it. Throughout his generations it shall not go out in jubilee. But the houses in the villages which have no wall around them shall be counted as fields of the country. They may be redeemed and they shall go out in the year of Jubilee. So clearly we're talking about a wall that surrounds a city. Now you say, well, how do we know how big it is. All right, we'll give you an illustration. I think all of you have heard the story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. Joshua 2.3. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come unto thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out the country. But the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And before they were laid down, she came up to them on the roof. Now therefore I pray you, she said unto them, Swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, that I that ye will save alive my father and my mother, and my brethren and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. The men answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then, verse 15, then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall. That's our word, Choma. And she dwelt upon the wall. There's a whole house on the wall. We have a little bit later, down in chapter 6. The seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horn, and the seventh day shall compass the city seven times. The priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. That's Choma. And people shall ascend up every man straight before him. You think we have a wall? I think we do. Well... 
Our time is up. We have the Lord's table today. There are many other places. I'll just give you one, and you can look it up for yourself. If you look at the book of Nehemiah, the Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, is all about one thing. It's about the wall. The wall of the city of Jerusalem. The word wall shows up over and over and over and over again in the book of Nehemiah. Only one word is used for wall. Choma. That is the word that is used in our text. Where it says the water stood in walls. On either side of them, on their right, on their left. And the children went, of Israel went through the midst of the sea. Protected in the rear by the Shekinah glory. Darkness for the Egyptians, life for the Israelites. It, you know, because big tall walls on either side made out of seawater going down 600 feet. About how deep the Red Sea is in that place. You don't have much light down there. But the Shekinah glory gave them light. They gave darkness to the Egyptians. They could hear the noise ahead of them. They're sort of following their senses, you know, and every now and then they bump into water and wonder, what in the world is that here? You know, They're going, 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 going. <laughs> I've often pictured and wondered to myself, I wonder if any light penetrated through that water, if they saw sharks swimming along there, just licking their lips, waiting for a bite. <laughs> oh, people, we have a sovereign God. A mighty God, a magnificent God. The walls of the city of Jerusalem, you've seen some of the modern walls. Those are small compared to the walls in the days of Solomon. Those walls that you see were built by the Mamelukes, Muslim conquerors. Those walls are pitiful compared to the Herodian walls, the days of Christ. The blocks in the walls in the days of Christ were 20 to 25 feet long, 10 to 15 feet tall, 10 to 15 feet thick, each single stone. That's a wall. And that's what was on each side of the children of Israel as they passed through the midst of the sea. Do you think God is able to protect you? Do you think God is able to bless you? What was the first thing we learned in our text today? It goes back to a promise God made to Abraham when he cut his covenant with Abraham and walked between the cut pieces and he said, your children, your descendants are going to serve another nation and then I will bring them out with a strong hand and he made a covenant and to remind them of that covenant, God made another path through the midst of the sea. And they followed God's command and walked forward. Oh, that we might do the same. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. It's magnificent because you are a magnificent God. You're the sovereign, eternal creator of all the universe. You're the one who has provided for us redemption from hell, from the pit from the flames, from the darkness, because your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, paid the price and bore the penalty and suffered your divine wrath for our sins. Father, as we come to the Lord's table this morning, we are reminded of redemption you always point throughout scripture to the crossing of the Red Sea as the point of redemption for Israel. The blood of the Passover lamb has just been slain and now you are making them into your people, making them into the nation, bringing them forth, cutting covenant with them again. And yet all those covenants point to and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He has cut a covenant with us, a bleeding sacrifice on Mount Calvary. He's opened the way for us to heaven, a chasm that we could not cross, even as Israel could not cross the Red Sea. 
He has protected us from all that would try to kill us before we can get there. Yet none of those whom you have chosen will ever be lost. You've guaranteed it. And he has delivered us on the other side as he destroyed the enemy, even as Jesus, through his death and resurrection, destroys every enemy, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, because Jesus is alive. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray for your blessing upon this table of which we are about to partake. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.